to the Leaders Forum, uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome Martha Samuelson, President and CEO of Analysis Group, uh, to this Leaders Forum. Martha, welcome. Thank you. Um, it, Martha really has a very distinctive uh, approach to leadership, uh, one that emphasizes uh, the firm's mission, uh, the importance of uh, values and, and behaviors. I've actually delayed inviting Martha to Yale, uh, in part because, you know, I, I've probably felt a little bit uncomfortable because I know her so well. Uh, <laughs> I've, I, uh, I've worked for Martha as an outside expert for the last six years or so and gotten to know her. Uh, but, and I thought, well, th this, this might be a little bit awkward. Uh, but on the other hand, she's such a great CEO and leader. Why deprive Yale School of Management of the opportunity to, uh, to have her here? So uh, I, I think I have a little bit of an extra insight into uh, the firm. Um, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to this conversation. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about her um, and, and Analysis Group. Um, analysis Group gets a lot of rave reviews. Um, Boston Globe uh, this past year identified uh, Analysis Group as, as the top place to work in, in Massachusetts in a particular category, the large company category. Um, for those of you who don't know Analysis Group, it provides economic, financial, and business consulting to uh, law firms, corporations, and governments. Uh, it's a private company. It's got about 600 employees, uh, nine offices in North America, and one outside the U.S. in Beijing. Um, Martha is a graduate of Yale College. She has a master's degree from MIT Sloan and uh, did her law degree at, at Harvard. Um, so let's see, what else should I say in terms of, uh, oh yeah, for those of you who follow Vault, um, this one was pretty interesting. Uh, Vault ranked Analysis Group the fourth best consulting firm to work at. It's pretty interesting when you think about the competition. Uh, so, um, Anyways, Martha, let me, let me get you started by taking you back. Uh, 21 years ago, you left uh, one consulting firm and uh, started to work at Analysis Group. And c can you just describe what the move was and what was Analysis Group like then? So I was at a company that um, was doing something fairly similar. I was at another economic consulting firm uh, called Putnam, Hayes & Bartlett, and it's now actually no longer on the planet. But I learned a lot of things from that firm, and some of them were things to do, some of them were things not to do. But the actual reason I left was it was a company that managed itself by office P&Ls, and so there was a, actually a quite long period of time, maybe a year, where some offices were just bursting at the seams, and the others had nothing to do. Alas, I was in one of the nothing to do ones, and so I looked around elsewhere in Boston, and, and my coming to analysis group, it just was an interesting, um, I suppose, time in the history of the firm. Um, I, I talked to some number of firms in Boston, and I really connected with the founder, and that turned out to be an enormously important relationship for me in my professional life. But I spent a lot of time with um, that person, and I looked at the firm, and I thought the firm seemed kind of shaky. The firm was small, and it wasn't quite in the league of the other economic consulting firms I was aware of. But the founder really seemed like somebody who, at an early point in my career, I, I wanted to make a bet on, and that, that turned out to be a good bet. So when you, uh, 
when you came into the firm, what, what role did you have? So I was still a very junior person. We would come. You didn't come in as president. I did not come in as president and CEO. Now that was its own and, and life. Obviously you, obviously, you were not the founder. I was not the founder. I was not the founder. Actually, another very interesting thing about the founders to me was I came in at a level that we would call manager now. It's you know maybe five years after uh, the operative graduate degree that you're going to use for that field. But the, um, the founders took an interest in me from an early point in at, uh, during my career at the firm, and they brought in a very preeminent business um, uh, consultant, I guess you would call these people executive coaches now, a fellow named Chris Arduous, who has written up quite frequently. I think he was mentioned in the Times again this last weekend. And they were very concerned about their ability to mentor and develop the next generation of people who they thought were going to be high achievers at the firm. And so I think I had a very unusual start when I got there because when I would sort of hit a bottleneck with these founders who, who wished so well, I think, for me and the other people like me, they would bring in Chris Arduous and we would sit there and have a discussion that was essentially mediated by a very talented um, person. I will say that's something I still do. That it was enormously impactful and, and meaningful to me because it just sort of, it removes the advantages of hierarchy and rank and it sort of takes them out of the decision making process. So I had a very unusual start there. So, so they had sort of ta targeted you as a potential leader yeah. of the firm. Yes, yes, among others, but among, uh, yeah, others. Um, among others, but definitely me, yeah. And then, and you came in and the firm was about 50 people yeah. at that time, 21 years ago. Yeah. And then w when, did, when did you become president and CEO? So that, that didn't happen all at once. That happened um, over a long period of time. So I think at the beginning, uh, probably two years after I had been there, the founders made me the head of a business unit, which at that time was called the economics business unit. And that has ended up being the whole firm. Um, and then it paths, it parts along the way. I guess I ran that and the two founders ran the company. And then at some point I co-ran the company with one of them. And then at some point he decided he wanted to reduce his management role and then, and then it became just me. But it's been very, um, everything at my firm, everything at the firm has been kind of evolutionary and that was a very evolutionary process as well. And, and just to give you a snapshot, now, now I mentioned you've got 600 employees, yep. nine offices. 11 private. offices. Oh yeah, that's right, excuse me. Excuse <laughs> me. And then, and then uh, and how about the revenues of the firm? Um, the revenues are about 260 million now. And when I took over the side that um, is now the whole thing, it was about seven and a half million dollars in sales. And so, you know, there was a problem with a bill or there was a problem with a this or a that. And you did wonder what was going to happen next week. Obviously, we're, we're, we're an enterprise now. It's a different thing. So, when, let's just, let me ask you a sort of basic question about your approach to leading a firm like Analysis Group, mm -hmm. which is a, obviously a high human capital firm dealing with complex issues. Do, do you go with this uh, set of responsibilities, go into this set of responsibilities with um, some overarching principles that you say, this is what I'm going to use to lead this firm? Or do you have, you mentioned sort of the, the, the negative lesson of having yeah. the office yeah. P&L and you're just learning and adjusting as you go. So, Ted, are you asking me to think back? I mean, there's not, the problem is in part, there's not any particular moment in time where I would say that was the moment that I became the, the head because it was much more. But as, as leader of the firm, do you think of yourself as always iterating, learning, 
uh, adjusting and you're <coughs> therefore uh, managing through a very complex set of decisions or do you see yourself as having some guiding principles that drive everything in terms of your decision making? Both. <laughs> and, okay, you know, so I, so I, I do see myself as having guiding principles, but I would call them somewhat more values um, that drive everything for me. And, you know, they're values of, yeah, you know, and they sound so corny, but they're very important to me. You know, treat people with respect. You have a long life. Um, what you contribute is going to be measured in lots of ways, and certainly that's not restricted to the financial. Um, but I, and the and the collaboration and teamwork with people you like is a very rewarding experience. But you know, I think of those as sort of more values and they're, but they are, they're, they're profoundly important values to me. Um, so how would they be sort of... What does that know, mean? And how it, would yeah. those be manifest in sort of, you know, if I know the firm, but if somebody were to be dropped into analysis group, how would they see these values manifested in behaviors? So I think that they would see uh, a huge emphasis on uh, not rewarding the political. They would see a huge emphasis on rewarding teamwork. They would see we don't have the senior people be the only people who speak at meetings. We, we have a culture where giving credit to others, saying that wasn't my idea, that was Ted's idea, is hugely valued, and I think actually, you know, for the partners, for the most senior people at our firm, um, often in a professional services organization, uh, selling the most works, the most important thing in the firm, it's not in our firm. The ability to make future partners and so to bring on and nurture the next generation. You're not considered to be a partner who's really made it, no matter how much business you bring in, if you've not demonstrated the ability to nurture and develop people and bring them along. So uh, the the stereotypical rainmaker who is yeah. uh, gathering and garnering resources yeah. but not developing people and always right, that person wouldn't do well at your firm? There's a role for that person, but that person will not be central to our organization, and that person will be perceived as having gotten to a place but really not gotten to the best and the highest place to, you know, to be the most value in, in the firm. And this, this emphasis on, on development of, of the future generation, how, how, how does that influence your, your leadership of the firm in terms of yeah. how, how do you allocate resources? How, how does that affect what you do? You know, it, it runs through everything. So it runs through, uh, it actually starts at the very beginning with who we hire. Um, we have, we get so many applications to work at the firm. Last year, I think we had 16,000 applications to work at the firm. So we're weeding out and we're screening way beyond just is somebody going to have the raw capability. And we're really screening on, you know, from the uh, most junior people who enter the firm, do they look like they're gonna understand what it means to be in an organization that values you know, team-based developmental work? Um, you know, we have upward evaluations for everybody. Lots of the partners have coaches. This year I'm gonna have the fellow who's my coach go around and interview all of the partners again this year, I had him do it five years ago. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What, you know, do other people need to be in my roles? Anything I can think of. So, I, you know, I think that we spend so much time sending the message that um, feedback is valued, development isn't the same thing as criticizing. Those are two very different 
processes with two very different agendas. And we just spend so much time on that whole part of it, both within the context of the casework and outside of the context of the casework, because it, it occurs in both places, I think. So, so many interesting things in place. So how, how much time do you spend on, on this reviewing other people piece yeah. of the, the work? So I spend an enormous amount of time on it. And actually, it's sort of one of the things I miss as the firm's gotten bigger. There was a time where I felt like I could do my job terrifically if I was just the best salesperson in the organization, which I'm not anymore. And if I could just do do that and then demonstrate this is the way, if I could be a role model, and then that was sufficient. I think now the organization is bigger and more complicated, and so I spend an enormous amount of time, not just on the development part of it, but there's another part that occurs in a big, complicated professional services organization, which is there are loads of decisions you have to make. There's loads of places where somebody's elbows could bump into somebody else's elbow. You have to have lots of conflict discussions about what work you take in the firm. You have to have lots of discussions about whether somebody in the LA office is equivalent to somebody who's getting promoted in the Chicago. So I spend an enormous amount of time on being sure, hoping, trying, you know, with the senior people, that the decisions that we're making as an organization seem collectively fair among all the individuals, because it's just a million decisions. So, so there's an old, uh, at least an old saying that I've heard a lot, that the more senior you get, you end up doing marketing in HR, but you're actually saying, in the end, HR wins out even in over marketing. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did have an experience about, you know, because I'm used to thinking of us as a small, slightly understaffed, on, especially on the administrative side organization. That's not really where we are right now, but I had a moment um, three months ago where we had eight partners who needed to meet on holiday card policy, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> what has happened to me? <laughs> eight senior people meeting on holiday card policy. Are we gonna send them out electronically? Are we gonna send out hard copies? And I thought, oh well. <laughs> Something has really happened. Yeah, I think it, at the end, HR wins. I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time, um, not just marketing, but it's sort of, I, I'd almost call it brand building. You know, I spend a lot of time um, meeting with senior people who might be clients. I spend a lot of time speaking now. That's really a different thing than um, compared to what I, used to do earlier, but I think the part of my job where I just think the firm wouldn't work if there weren't me or people doing it is the sort of refereeing in the constant sense that people have to feel the firm's fair. I know you and I have discussed the fact that we have one P&L for the whole organization, so we don't have practice area P&Ls, we don't have office P&Ls, and so there's an awful lot of sharing and trust that has to go on, and my job is to be there to make sure if anybody's feeling like this is not working quite correctly, we have a good process to make sure that people feel the outcome is as fair as possible. It's so interesting. So, so you also do one other thing that I'm aware of, which is, you know, to change uh, language, you're a player coach. I mean, yep. you also do some of the work, yep. whether it's the big litigation involving credit card companies or the, uh, the uh, high-tech Microsoft kind of yep. work. Why do you do that? Oh. <laughs> is, is that because you want to let people know that you're you, you can set a, a strong example in that dimension, or is that more like you want to keep yourself fresh? It's for me. Yeah. It's, it's for me. It's yeah. for me. I, I don't know what it would mean to the organization if I completely stopped doing it, but it's for me. I mean, the thing about client work, 
compared to the management work inside a complicated organization, the rewards are so much more direct. You know, you come up with a good idea, you explain to the client it's a good idea. They say yes, they say no, you demonstrate something in a clever way, you help a meeting go well. Those are very direct. I think the rewards for management, you know, there are moments certainly where I think I'm so glad I realized that we had to have some group of people come together and preview a decision before we brought it to the larger partner group because otherwise there were going to be people feather, feathers ruffled, people were going to feel unincluded and there are times, oh God, I'm so glad I remember. But that's very indirect that and I am so proud of the place and the people but that's, you know, that's not, it's the transactional sort of pride you get from consulting is very real. Um, but. And the other one is squishier, and you don't know when it will, right. when and if you'll actually, you know, be able to access the, the pride in it. So, if if you were to see this firm uh, walk into any of these offices, one of the things you would notice is it's got you know you've got this these partners around forty of them in the firm, but it is an extraordinarily young firm. Um, certainly makes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you just see it. It's, it's, there are a lot of very young people at analysis group. So um, w is that a conscious decision on your part uh, to, to keep the firm so youthful? No, the business really changed, I think, over, you know, the, over the 20 years that I've been actively in it. And I think the demand for, you know, these remarkably competent, um, skilled young people's just exploded. I think the fact is we can do, you know, the, I think our whole industry really changed because of computing power. It's not often where supply drives demand, but I think this is one of those pieces of the mm -hmm. world where it, it really does. I think the work used to be done by preeminent professors and graduate students. And so I think our whole field sprang up because it was possible to do so much more when uh, computing power exploded. But then I think it made, you know, there's a group of people who are particularly appropriate and skilled at that, and they're younger. I think our firm has moved up the curve towards bigger and more complicated projects. So as that has happened and we've had bigger case teams, it's not surprising to me that we have more younger people because the, the, they've got, they're the right people to be doing a lot of the, you know, a lot of the analytical work that we do. And at, at some point, Martha, did, did you say to yourself, this is way, you know, this is where the world's going and I see this shift, big data, you know, information is power, big data is where these cases are going, I'm going to invest in this capability, or was it more you just kept up with it better than other firms? I think we kept up with it better than other firms. So I, I think, think there's clear that different you have. things about our business model that made us successful, but I certainly don't think it's some superior ability that I have or any of the other senior people to recognize what's happening. I think that we made a better career track, we've made a better career track for young people who enter our firm. So I think we get better young people as a result of that. We have some number of people who've entered our firm as analysts who are very senior partners in the organization. The fact that that can happen, that you can join as the youngest person and end up running the organization, those are better jobs. And I actually think the fact that we, the senior people, think that might happen means we're treating everybody from the minute they come in the door, these may be partners. You know, we don't, we treat people differently because of that. But I think it's been much more, the success of the firm hasn't been, it has been much more about the, you know, there certainly have been moments of insight in terms of the outside world, 
um, or where we might build capability or that type of thing. But I think an awful lot of it has just been this business model about develop, hire good people, develop them, treat them with respect. Build that trust as yeah. opposed to I'm going to put a chit on this entrepreneurship block or strategy, yeah. you know, yeah. strategic yeah. spot and you're you're building this this more general human capital that's that's exactly the way i would and describe letting it, it yeah letting it go to where where the business yeah. is yeah yeah so what let, let me shift a little bit what happens when somebody is not meeting standards at ag i mean i obviously you've got it must happen. Yeah, You've, we've you actually know, gotten, mistakes. Yeah, either so, at the partner level yeah. or, you know, early on the analyst level. So those are really different. Very different. R really different. Um, you know, I, 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 we're all very aware that with the analysts, your people, the people are potentially having their first, um, uh, you know exposure to the professional world. And it's easy to make mistakes. I was reading in the um, uh, Times over the weekend a uh, little excerpt from Sonia Sotomayor's autobiography. It was so fascinating. So she described herself as getting to Princeton and getting C's because she had no idea what an essay was. And then she graduated Phi Bates, summa cum laude, top grade, anyone in the, but you know, so some of that is just people come with different sets of experiences and I would hate to be harsh with respect to that. On the other hand, I do think that we have gotten clearer eyed as an organization about the fact that what we do may not be for everybody and not making it at analysis group doesn't mean you're not going to make it at lots of other places. And it does feel to me and to us as if there's a point where you try to help. First, you try to understand what the problem is. You try to diagnose it. You try to give solutions and strategies. But if after a while that's not working, there comes a point where everybody is better off to say, we want to help you find the next thing, but we are not the right thing uh, anymore. And we've had people who've left and done enormously well in different activities, and that's great. So um, I'm going to open it up for, for questions and dialogue in, in a moment. Um, in, in, the, in the piece in the New York Times where, where you were featured, um, one thing that, that you commented on was was uh, a topic that gets discussed a lot, and that's um, how, how, to, how to deal with your mentor, what to ask mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And you had some, some sort of different kind of advice, and you might want to share that with, with everybody here. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I think, you know, again, these are words that I know now. At the time when this was going, when I myself was looking for a mentor, when I myself, ended up at analysis group, I don't think I necessarily would have known that those words were what that life experience is going to be. But I do think, you know, it's, it's not very complicated. I think people picking mentors for reasons other than the fact that you deeply connect with somebody is a huge mistake. You know, the strategic mentor, that's not going to help you out. You want the mentor who, um, is, you know, is going to be invested in you, and those tend to be uh, reciprocal relationships who you like. But the other thing I find that um, is enormously valuable, and I do think I did this with the founder of our firm, was I would come to him all the time and say, I think I did this wrong. I'm afraid. I, sh I called when I should have emailed. I sent this out too quickly, I don't like the words. And so I think it made it very easy and safe for him to say to me, maybe you did. Maybe you should have done this differently. And I have a lot of people who I'm the mentor of now in our firm. And the ones that I love working with are the ones who do that with me. I think I, you know, tee up the problem, make it easy to give them feedback as opposed to the people where I feel like it's going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat with them to get, you know, through you need to return emails. It's not fun. And 
I, I think the people who make it easy for you, they just get so much more out of you. Um, so, and, and they make it, well, they just so get you so much use, more. So you would present an issue and say, here's what I did, I think I did it well or incorrectly, but I'm not sure. I'd probably and start with incorrectly, incorrectly, because I think you want to put the fact that it could have gone badly on the table and make it safe. So, you know, going in and saying, I think I did it well, so what? Great. <laughs> the, you know, the real issue is saying to the person who could help you, if um, I want to make it safe for you to be candid and open with me. Very interesting. So, uh, so in sum, we've got a, a wonderful CEO. She, she built a business from seven million to 250 million. Uh, she's foregone a lot of standard business practices like you know, P&Ls based on offices or lines of business, one P&L, uh, very intensive review therefore of people, but not not necessarily based on all the usual yeah. metrics, yeah. and and uh, a big weight on probably teamwork, collaboration, how individuals are helping others to do yeah. their work. Uh, a company that's remained private, and I didn't get into this, in a, in a space <coughs> where you've got a lot of public companies, and uh, that's Martha's decision. And my partners. And I, partners. Luckily, but, but if you I had couldn't said, jam it down their throats. But, 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 well, <laughs> now that's, that's partly because of who you've developed as partners. Yeah. But, but if you, I, I suspect if you had taken a different tack somewhere along the line, you would be a public company, and I, there's not, you know, magic in being public or private, but, uh, but you've got a, a very interesting uh, example of leadership here, and, and with that I'll open it up to comments, questions for Martha Samuelson. Hi, thank you very much for speaking here sure. today. Uh, I have a question about how you, how you balance uh, creating a central corporate culture while managing multiple different offices around the country and now around the world. Uh, it, I, it's my impression that a lot of those offices have their own unique culture within the, the yeah. LA office or the Chicago office. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you make sure through the systems that you're creating or the messages that you're sending out to staff that there is a central culture while also giving them the liberty to develop a unique culture for their own particular office? Well, that's a terrific question, and I think the answer is probably imperfectly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there's some amount of processes that we, the, the, there are different people in different offices. In some offices, we've got 11 offices now, with the smallest one being really a, a towhead in Beijing. Some of the offices have lots of partners, some of the offices have only one. The culture is just inherently different in, in those types of, you know, if they're more senior people and less senior people. Uh, you know, to try to keep it as cohesive as possible, um, you know, we, we have structures, we probably have more than we used to. One thing that we do is all of the compensation for the entire firm is done by the partners across the firm. So, you know, from the most entry level up through the uh, near partners, all of the partners uh, agree to that together. So there has to be some consensus about values and what's important and who's progressing and what metrics we're <laughs> even evaluating on that, that come from that. But I do think the offices are somewhat different. I, I, I think it's clear to everybody that this issue of creating partners is kind of the most important thing that we think you can do. But, um, you know, it, it's something I think about. I think it's something that the most senior people think about, and I think we do it as well as we can, and it probably isn't perfect. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my question, I'll, I'll state it simply. Uh, the growth results that I just heard are very impressive, and I was just wondering, 
Um, what was the strategy that was discussed to, for growth? And then how did you know you were going in the right direction? Uh, like what results showed that this strategy is working? And did you have to change it in any, in, in, during this? Uh, so one of my partners over here, Pierre Crumia, and I have, one of my business partners, and I have actually been talking about this quite a bit recently because, you know, we've always had a um, uh, mantra, I guess, which is um, we don't have a five-year plan. I've come to think that what that really means is we don't think the growth of the organization is going to come from top down. It's not going to come from the senior me, Pierre, the other senior people in the organization saying grow this business activity 10% or grow this office 10%. I think um, that instead what has turned out to be enormously successful uh, for growing in the organization is almost um, encouraging people to be entrepreneurial champions within the organization. So not to be cowboys, not to go off and try to do something on their own or unknown to the firm. But we have a huge active healthcare practice that really runs across from uh, healthcare strategy to litigation to health outcomes. And it's actually the, the the genesis of our office in China. And it really, actually that practice area at many points in the way, how it started and how it expanded, were just people who said, I see something where I think this firm, people who look like the people at this firm with the skill sets of the people at this firm are gonna be able to um, uh, do it and succeed, and, and, and then coming to me, coming to the other senior people saying, I'm thinking of doing this, I'm thinking of hiring an epidemiologist, I'm thinking that we should open an office in Canada where there are people with different um, quantitative skill sets. So it's been people who are champions and the firm just encouraging them and supporting them and supporting them when they have bumps in the road. But it hasn't been the result of, it's not my strategy or you know, central command strategy. It's really encouraging people to be entrepreneurial within the confines of the platform. And I don't know that I knew those were the, exactly the words to describe it. It really has been a discussion we've been having recently. Wow, wow what was it that made us be successful at extending into these different areas, but I think it was the not top down, but still the being very entrepreneurial within the platform. So. And you, you also avoided layoffs in, over the whole history of the firm. Yeah, so that's been a different is, thing. That, that's different, but it's also somehow you allowed people to be entrepreneurial without exposing the firm to so much risk that we're when, very when careful you, yeah. yeah we're very careful the layoff issue actually that to me is more relevant for the younger people but that really was a decision it's every year that we've had the firm has not been a great year we've had lots of great years that's how we went from seven to 260 but when we've had bad years or flat years, we've really had a decision, made a decision, the partners, that we would absorb it, and we've never had a layoff in the history of the firm. And that I am proud of, because I think it just means something. It, it, again, maybe it's about how we think of entry-level people joining in the firm and what ought to be our responsibility and what ought to be their responsibility. But. Um, it's funny, I guess when we ranked very highly in the vault the first time was in August a couple of years ago, and we were actually having a pretty slow year that year, and then somehow the vault thing showed up, wow, and I th thought, I've got to send something to everybody in the firm saying, isn't this great? But then I thought, they're going to think I'm a nut, we're not busy enough, and I'm sending something. So I asked one of our sons, who happened to be an analyst at the firm at that point in time, can I send an email saying, 
we're not at fault, great, we're not as busy as we want to be, but don't worry, we've never had a layoff and we're never going to. He said, Mom, you cannot put that word in an email to the firm when the utilization is 60% or whatever it was. So I did not, <laughs> I used other words. But we never have and we've never rescinded an offer and we've never done anything like that and that, that has been a big deal for us. But that, that was at the, that was a, a partner kind of decision. It was a partner decision. They were willing to take it on the chin, so to speak, yep. to make that work. Yep, yep. Um, so touching on the, you mentioned it towards the end um, of your, your comments there, uh, being publicly organized versus privately organized and how that yeah. um, plays into the incentives within the firm sure. and also how um, the values of the firm as well. Um, having come from a public uh, economic consulting firm, I'd be really interested to hear your perspective on some of the pros and cons of being privately organized. I'll give you the cons. <laughs> the pros are that some of the senior people will make a lot of money. Um, I You're think they about already the public. The public, yeah, I think the public. The, those are the pros. I don't see. I don't see a lot of other pros to to it as a business model. Um, you know, I think. One of the things, I think you have to have a layoff if you're a public firm. I think the, you know, the market disciplines you in a different way. I don't think you're able to make some of those, we're going to sit this out for the longer type decisions that we, we are able to make. I think you, it's impossible not to have the quarterly pressure manage you. Um, I just think we have the luxury of making really long term decisions, um, you know, for the firm. And personally, I don't want the firm to go out of business when I'm not there. I don't want to feel like I've, you know, taken all the money out and that haven't I done this miraculously and efficiently and that the next day it disappears. I want, you know, there's so much more utility for me in this organization that's going to go on and when my seat's not here, when I'm not in this seat, my seat will be here and other people will be in it. I think that's really hard to do at a public firm, in particular public software firms, they make tons of sense to me. You've built a product, it's a different business model. But public um, professional services firms, I think that that's a, the, the pressure to underinvest in the people afterwards and to overinvest in the business developers, I think is just overwhelming. And you know, I, I, you know when I thought about that for me, I would think about, people I cared about tremendously coming into my office and quitting and me thinking they were doing the right thing. I just thought, I don't want to do that. It's not worth it to me. And, and not just me. It's actually, we have a group of senior people at the organization who've all been there for a while who are just utterly aligned on this topic and a lot of topics that are similar to this topic about what's important to all of us. So. Pretty clear. Oh, thank you. Um, the single balance uh, P&L seems a unique feature for the company in the industry. So my question is, um, how do you align the interests of your employees um, in LA office, in Beijing office, with the company's overall mission, or the interests for the company as a for-profit entity? Thank you. So I, I, that's not that dissimilar from the culture question uh, across the offices. It's, it's a form of the same question. I mean, I think, you know, there's a partner in every office. We have to, uh, you know, we, we have to rely on the partners to sort of be the emissaries, I guess, of, you know, the group of us in, in each office. Um, but I think we have to, you know, I, Aligning incentives, um, you know, I think we have to create a common bar and we have to, uh, you know, in terms of promotion and advancement and compensation, we have to be sure that as a group it's being uh, managed so it feels equal to people in the offices. I don't know if that's your question exactly. Um, 
you know, I never want to have somebody feel like if they move from one office to another office, they'll get a better deal. That's not good for the company. And so we have to, you know, work to not make that happen so that it feels that the return for what you do is going to be the same no matter which office you're in. Is, is that answering your question? I'm not sure it is. the entire company, how do you evaluate the, you know, the individual performance in each office? Because, you know, kind of um, there are maybe some other reason why this office underperform the overall average level. So we don't have an office P&L, so we don't have a yep. measure of how an office is performing relative to another office. We have lots of, we have 600 individuals who are working at the firm. So obviously I don't look at every analyst, but we have a group that looks at analysts all across the firm. We have a group that looks at associates all across the firm. So, we, you know, we painfully and slowly <laughs> is how we do it. We spend a lot of time on it together and you know in some sense the process of those discussions involves all the partners agreeing this is what we think. This is what we think is the right return and the right path and the right level for this person in Dallas doing this and it seems comparable to this person in LA. We spend a lot of time talking. There really isn't another way. And and you and to maybe extend the question, yeah. you would probably try to take into account if if there was a, a transitory uh, factor in the background that yeah. would would say shift the demand out for the New York office people, even though it's not a there's not a separate PNL. There might be a, a strong wave of work related to banks. all the mortgage backed stuff. Yeah. So that that's something that where you wouldn't, am I correct, that you wouldn't necessarily say, wow, those people are really smart and talented, <laughs> and therefore they get to, you know. Run the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you would just say, listen, let's, let's take a more measured evaluation of their contribution, and maybe the tech sector isn't as strong yeah. right now, and that could, that could influence how individual performance would look. Is that fair? Yeah, but again, aside from the business developers, everybody who's doing the work, because we have only one P&L for the whole firm, if the people in New York are too busy and the people in Boston are not busy enough, the people in Boston should be working with people in New York. And there's an enormous amount of that that goes on. They're really, you know, it, it's a huge benefit to the firm. I mean, it's, you know, for somebody like you who works with us, Ted, Ted, you can have huge case teams from many offices and then at other periods of time less. It's just sort of, we can do that as the demand um, shifts because we're not, the people are not uh, restricted to offices or to uh, particular, you know, lines, lines of, of business. business. Yeah. yeah. You've positioned yourself as having a very unique culture amongst economic consulting firms. Have there been instances where your culture has conflicted with those of your clients? And if so, how do you handle those? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, I think that I don't see it as a direct conflict. So that, that I, I do have a feeling that the clients are better served by, I, I think we are more direct than some of the other firms are. Um, I do think of us as, you know, we're kind of like doctors. So we're not really serving a client well if we tell them they don't have a problem when they do have a problem. And there are firms that do that. And certainly if you're in the litigation world, a lot of cases settle. You may get, get away with it for a long time if you just tell the clients, you're right, you're right, you're right, winner, winner, winner. So we don't do that. Um, I, you know, I think the clients are on the whole better served by, so one, that aspect of our business model. I think they're better served by the flatter team. So it may mean that they don't always have the seniorist person 
directing all the work. I'm just trying to honestly think out loud, is that a problem? But I actually think on cases I've been involved with, the fact that the younger people feel so empowered is really a huge benefit to the client because there's some number of times where a younger person will say, I think that's a mistake or that number should have been multiplied by two and it wasn't or why didn't you count that in and and they're right and it's so I I think on the whole our business model is a business is a, is a better business model for the clients I think the more empowered everybody is in the case team to raise their hand and say this could be improved in some way the better so I, I it's I don't I don't I think they're better off. I think actually it's something the clients don't necessarily all realize, which is that the support team is so important because they're just doing an awful lot of work in back of the expert and that that if you forget about that, which I think some of the public firms do, I think you put the expert at, at some risk because they you just can't know everything. If I could maybe just add to this, and I think it links up to the question on the public <laughs> versus private, but not necessarily in that frame. Yeah, it the, does link the, up. The, 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 your question, I think, really is, to me, very interesting. It gets at this question of quality and, and reputation and alignment with your clients or customers. And at any one point in time, a firm like Analysis Group or any firm with a reputation can cash it in. Uh, they can say to a, a prospective client, we can, we can do better, we can position you in a certain way and get a line of business, but that's going to cause problems down the road. And to, to restrain yourself from doing that, you yeah. have to have a horizon. You have to think about the flow of clients, and therein lies the potential alignment with your clients over the long term. So it really goes back to commitment to quality, integrity, uh, having the teams check each other. But there are certain situations where whatever firm you're talking about, whatever enterprise, there are going to be temptations to say, right now I need the money, <laughs> and overpromise, but and wait for the under uh, delivery to happen later on. Yeah, or the client to say to you, which is a somewhat comparable thing, I want, I'm not going to hire you unless the person you are working with is willing to say X. And exactly. you have to say to yourself, if X is really not right, um, this is not for us. My comment delayed a question from a very important person. Yeah. So. Who is that? <laughs> this is the question that scares me. <laughs> well, what I wanted to ask about was that I noticed in the Boston Globe article that the analysis group offers new hires further education at the expense of the company. And I want, like, to go to MIT Sloan School or to do further studies somewhere. What led you to that decision? Um, a particular analyst who's now the head of our Denver office, followed by another analyst, Rebecca Kirk, who's very connected with many of us. It was just, you know, so much of what has worked out for the business, just to abstract for, from that for a minute, has been there was a moment in time and it just seemed obvious that we wanted something to happen. And so, okay, we've got this fabulous guy. We really want him to come back. What are we going to do? Okay, well, let's try this. And I think so many of the things that we have done that have worked out right, just the situation presented itself and then it looked like something, okay, maybe this is a good idea to uh, to continue on with this in a more programmatic way. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Hi, I was interested in one of your earlier comments about how when you get to the senior ranks of management, it transitions much more into a marketing and HR role. Yeah. And I'm interested that in most corporations, you typically see the C-suite executives coming out of finance and kind of the more traditional business lines, whereas I know kind of human resources has often traditionally been siloed. 
And I'm wondering if you think that there's implications either within your organization or more broadly for the types of training and development that future managers need in that regard. So I think there's a sea change going on in the world right now with respect to human resources. And certainly, you know, at earlier points in my career, I thought these are the people who tell you what you can't do, and that's all that they do. And um, in our firm, the human resource people, they're involved in everything. They're in, you know, they sit, they, they come to all the partners' meetings, they are, they are involved in every discussion, but discussion of the partners, discussions with the partners. I think, though, that, so that that's different for us. Um, I think that's a change that's really going on in the world now. We're, in fact, in the process of bringing on a new head of HR in our firm. And the person is a, you know, Williams undergraduate, Stanford B School graduate, former consultant at a management consulting firm who decided that it was actually put through Stanford by that firm. And then she came back and she decided, no, she wanted to be involved in HR. So I think that track is really moving up to be something different. I think that's a track people should really be thinking about. It's, it's that that's going to be different in the world going forward. Mm -hmm. People are too important and it's perceived to be that how you develop and manage and grow them is uh, is so central. You know, this, we're in we're in the we're in the brain world now, and the, that's more important than I think necessarily some aspects of the financial management. One last question. Yep, I think earlier you said that maybe sixteen thousand people applied last year to your firm. Yeah. Um, there's probably hundreds of qualified candidates, but given the company size, you probably accept somewhere in the magnitude of half of one percent. I would guess. Yeah. So how do you, what are the, can you talk more about those, how you screen out those 99.5% of the candidates? I'm probably not the right person for that because that's less something that I'm involved with. Um, it is something, because an awful lot of those people are applying for analyst jobs, although not across the board. You know, I, again, we, I think we have, a, and so we've pushed that down in the firm. One of the things actually that sort of stepping back has worked really well. How have we sort of maintained the culture as the firm has gotten so unbelievably much larger, has been pushing management roles down. So, you know, I manage vice presidents, vice presidents manage associates, associates manage analysts, and, and that sort of empowering of groups of people lower down in the organization, I think has been a really big thing in just sort of keeping the culture getting transmitted down. But so we have a lot of people involved in it. Um, I know we look a lot past the CV. We really want to look for people who are going to be, enjoy a collaborative environment. It's not for everybody. I, everybody but, but thinks it might Yale be. But having Yale on the resume or the CV is a good thing. Having Yale on the resume <laughs> will get you a look, that's for sure. <laughs> so. So I want to thank everyone for your wonderful questions. Yeah, um, really. I, I, you know, I thought so many of them were um, were terrific, and thank you for being here. Uh, you know, the insights that you get oftentimes derive from from looking at what you might think of as extreme cases, um, extremely successful organizations. This is, you know, uh, a company that is a human capital brain business yeah. operating in a very highly complex environment and uh, in some sense it tells you a lot about where other companies need to go or should go given the importance of human capital. It's, that's, that's the most important form of capital in the modern economy. So you can learn a lot from looking at this kind of organization, and then, uh, as I said, then you've got a very successful organization with a very unique approach to managing that human capital. So for that, I want to thank Martha for wow. being uh, a wonderful guest at our Leaders Forum, and we wish her and Analysis Group continued success. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much.